Well, good morning. I was so excited when Chad said that normally the preaching goes till 12:30. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. We'll we run out of fall asleep about noon. Right, right. I knew that there was a sense of humor when I got to meet Tom when I uh, arrived here uh, this morning. I'm going to do a quick uh, um, uh, study on uh, where you're at in terms of media. So I'm going to begin this sermon by saying the following words, and I'm going to know whether or not whether or not you are truly educated. You'll see what I mean in a moment. Ordination. Ordination is what brings us together here today. <laughs> How many of you know where that comes from? <laughs> Princess Bride, a slight twist. If you haven't seen... Well, how many of you have ever read the Bible? Okay, how many of you have ever seen Princess Bride? Oh, the two girls in the head. All right, all right, I just want to share that. There are uh, a lot of, and I do mean a lot of young people, who have never heard <coughs> this phrase, but I'm going to hold it for a couple of minutes before you hear the phrase. Instead, what they often hear, and I get young people at the university, 18 years of age, 19, 20, and I can tell a lot about their parenting by how they respond. But instead, this is what they often hear. Son, daughter, you could have. You should have done better. Or, well, I hope you succeed at this harebrained notion. Or, it's really not what we were hoping for, but whatever. Nothing is worse than whatever. Amen? When you hear that, whatever. Well, your career path surely doesn't pay much unless you get on TV. Or your grandfather would roll over in his grave if he knew the career you chose. Which is interesting if gran Grandpa was cremated. Um, when I meet somebody from an LDS background, from the Mormon church, and they have a son or a daughter that is committed to go on a mission for several years at their own expense, LDS parents will look at the parent of that child and go, wow, tell us what you did. We want to succeed like that. But in an evangelical or a Protestant church, if a parent sheepishly says, my son is going into the ministry, friends will say, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Where do you think you went wrong? Is your son dealing drugs and does he have tattoos all over his body? There are Many, many young people who have never heard this phrase. And this is the phrase that I, I even heard as communion was being served, people's comments. But this is the phrase that needs to be echoed today and then passed on to our families. We're very, very proud of you, Chad. Proud. Amen. <laughs> what I want to do is I want to spend a couple of minutes... And I want to talk about some unusual ordination services in the Bible. Now, I could come before you and I could speak, but here's what the Greek word means, here's the Hebrew background, but why put all of you to sleep? So rather, what I would like to do is to take you on a wonderful journey through the Bible to some unusual, unusual ordination services. So the very first thing I want you to do is come back with me to creation. I want you to come back when God made the heavens and the earth in how many days did God make the heavens and the earth shut it out? And on the seventh day, he went where? Fly fishing. Now, let me tell you about what God did at the end of every day. He looked at what he had made at the end of every day, and he said, and you have to learn to say this Hebrew word with me. By the time you leave church today, you will say, I learned to speak in tongues on the same day that Chad was ordained. So the Hebrew word for good is tov. Say tov. Yeah, yeah. And day one, oh, God made the, the greater light. He made the, the light, and then he made the sky and the water and the land and the plants. Day two, every day, Tov, day two. Day three, God said, Tov. Day four, God said, Tov. God said, day five, Tov. And partway through day six, God said, Tov. But then, the seventh time, God said, Tov. If you know anything about the Hebrew thoughts, seven is always really important. And the seventh time, ready for this? Say it with me. Tov mayod. Tov mayod. you got to say it with me. Tov mayod. 
And it's like God looking at creation and looking at what he did and looking at an ordination service that I'll mention in a moment and God going, whoa, whoa. you got to think of God now. What God did is he said, let us make Adam in our image and our likeness. And then God did something. He entrusted governorship to Adam. He didn't say you can rule over creation. The Hebrew word is, I'm entrusting you with my paradise garden. And you're the steward of my garden. And what God did for Chad is, Chad, God made you a farmer and a rancher, and these are all your sheep. Now, here's the thing about herding sheep. How many of you have ever owned a dog? How many of you have ever owned a cat? None of you. You don't own cats. They own you. <laughs> Sometimes sheep are interesting as well, but God is ordaining you, first of all, to be a rancher, to be in charge of a, a, a flock. And second of all, God is also making you a vintner. I had to look that one up to get it pronounced right. Do you know what a vintner is? It's somebody who raises grapes and vineyards. And so you are put in charge of that. But when people whine, you have to realize that comes with being a bit nervous. People will whine quite a bit, try to avoid partaking of much. But when God looked at finally, the final act of creation was when God entrusted Adam and said, this is your role. And then God stood back and said, Tov Mov, very good. So today, that's what I hear God saying at this service. I picture God in the balcony of heaven. And how many of us were raised in a background where God was this ornery cuss who got up on the wrong side of the bed? But that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is the God of Jesus. And he looks over the banister of heaven, if we can use the real human language, and he puts his thumb up and goes, yeah, this is cool. God says, Tov Mayod, this is really cool. And then there is a neat lesson about a younger and older brother. I don't know, do you have a brother here today? Where's he at? I'm just kind of, ah. And your first name? Jeremy. Jeremy. Okay, Jeremy. I'm going to involve you in this storytelling for a moment. Um, in the book of Exodus, chapter 29. God, oh, it's so incredible. God told the older brother, his full name was Jeremy Moshe, uh, Moses. And what God said to Moses is, I want you to lay Kadesh. I want you to make holy. I want you to set apart your younger brother and uh, make this a special day. So Moses gathered all of Israel in front of the tent of the meeting, the Mishkan, that wonderful tabernacle of the Lord, and you got to experience this. Imagine you're at Mount Sinai. What would it be like if you were at Mount Sinai? Mount Sinai went there one time in my life. When I was there, I rode a camel to the top of it until the saddle slipped off to the side. <laughs> and the Bedouin says, you too big, get off, walk. And I did, I walked to the top of Mount Sinai for sunrise. It's red granite rock that catches that sun when it rises up. I want you to hear the sound, the sounds of that ordination service. And uh, we probably have to be up in Harrisburg and Monroe to really open the windows and hear these sounds. But I want you to hear the sounds of, of rams that are bleating and of bulls that are bellowing about to be sacrificed. I want you to smell the fresh incense baked bread with fragrant anointing. We need to anoint you with oils today too. 30 weight or 40? And then I want you to think about sights. Oh, the sights as Moses brings out those wonderful garments. And then Moses the older begins to ordain his younger brother. The younger brother's name, anybody know right offhand what the younger brother's name was? And it means God exalts, God honors. And today is a God exalting, God honoring day for you. But Jeremy, I need to tell you that in order to be biblical in the story, the very first thing you do is you wash your brother. That's a terrifying thought, isn't it? We'll skip over that portion of the service and we'll continue moving right on. But I want you to picture. You're the one that gets to clothe your brother with this wonderful, wonderful vestment of a high priest to serve uh, the Lord. The very first thing you bring out is a fine flax linen tunic. It's white as the snows that gather in the winter on Mount Sinai. And then you wrap Aaron with a girdle. Now, I read that in the King James Version, and I couldn't imagine wrapping Chad with a girdle. I don't know what he would look like, but then I found out a newer translation said 
It's a sash or belt that goes around his waist. And then there's this beautiful deep blue ephod robe that was arrayed upon you, set over the top and around the bottom were these golden pomegranates that were actually bells, and as you walked, you would tinkle. But then I thought there must have been a better word for that. <laughs> as you're making noise, as the bells go along. And then uh, on top of that, there was this 12 gem studded breast piece that was fitted in front with shoulder patches of twin onyx. Each were bearing the six tribes, six tribes, six tribes of, the, of Israel. And then wrapped around your noble brow was a mitered turban of fine linen. Because in the Jewish faith, no man comes before God without wearing a hat. What would happen if a guy wore a hat in here during a church service? Take that off, you've got to honor God. And Aaron would go, oh, no, 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 you need to wear a hat when you come before God. So I expect all the men to have minor turbans, turbans next Sunday. And then there was, on the front of that turban, was a curved gilded diadem. And it was fitted to the forehead, and it bore the phrase, Kadesh Ladonai, you are holy to the Lord for the work that God has set you aside. And then I picture Jeremy, or I picture Moshe standing back from Aaron, and I picture a three-letter word coming off of his lips when he looks at his brother dressed and set apart for God, and that three-letter word is, wow. Say it with me. Wow. Now, on the other hand, if your spouse says to you, wow, that's a different tone when you need to run. Everybody know the difference between wow and wow? But today it's a wow. It's something wonderful. And Chad, we are proud. Wow. Very proud of you. But, you know, I got to thinking, in reality, what are you arrayed with? What are you clothed with today? And I think you are arrayed by your family, your friends, and your Father in heaven with the vestments of the book of Colossians, chapter 3. Uh, I've talked to people about you, and I've observed it myself. You are clothed with compassion and kindness. You have garments of gentleness and patience. You have the fine habit of forgiveness. Especially, you have the great linen of love, which binds everything together. And then you have the priestly clothing of peace, which makes such a difference. And as a priest, you stand before the people and you say, May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his face upon you, and may the Lord grant you shalom, peace to everybody. That's beautiful clothing that God has arrayed you with. And then there is a, well, sometimes people will get to know you. I mean, Jeff back there is just going, I don't know about this chap, dude. You know, it, it takes a while for people to get to really appreciate. There was a very old prophet by the name of Samuel, and he was saddened over the fallen tall Saul. And so he went out to seek a man, a man after God's own heart. And he heads to a sleepy little town called Fall Creek. I'm sorry, Bethlehem. Just south, outside of the Jebusite Jerusalem. And out comes a dad to greet the wizened prophet. And the prophet said, I am looking for a future king to anoint to Messiah to ordain. And Jesse brings out three sons. They're warrior sons, we're told later in, in 1 Samuel 17. Jesse brings out, first of all, Eliab. Ah, oh, you look at Eliab. Now, Eliab, ladies, was one of those guys that had washboard abs. I've discovered the older I get, I have speed bump abs. Anybody else have something like that? Amen. All right, all right. But there, there was Abinadab, and there was Shema, and seven sons went by, and a confused Samuel said, is this the best you got? Do you have anybody else? And Jesse goes, well, I got David, but he's out with the widow, but he turned his sheep taking care of him. And they brought him in, the one who was forgotten by family, but remembered by God. That was the one who would fight a giant, the giant of being overlooked. And Chad, in the ministry that you're going to be doing, there's going to be times when you're going to have to fight giants, and you're going to have to be willing to go against them with five round stones and a slingshot. But I want you to look at that giant in the face, and I want you to say to him these following words. When you look at that guy, that giant, whatever it is, you look at it and you say, fee fi fo fum my foot, you Philistine, you're going down today. <laughs> and 
you draw that sword out and you take out that head and you hold it up in front of the army of the Philistines and say, anybody else want to defy the armies of God? And your three brothers that used to mock you will go, oh, that's my, my kid brother. We're, we're like this, you know? <laughs> yeah. But sometimes we do get overlooked. But I also want to picture the women that are here today that have been so instrumental within your life. Come with me to the New Testament to a small town named Lystra. That's where we get the mouthwash Listerine from. And uh, it's nestled... That's not true, don't... You know, that was just a memory device. Nestled at the base of this great black mountain, there was a single parent mom and her mom who helped raise a remarkable son. And I think there is a remarkable son and some ladies here that are pretty awestruck as to how you turned out. But you know, when they raised you in a little sleepy town called Fall Creek, is that right? They never would have dreamed that you would have had an opportunity in such a remote place to be able to sit under some pretty incredible people and to be mentored. But you see, for Timothy, it was pretty awesome because mom and grandma thought Timothy will never get to go to Jerusalem where he can study under the school of Shema and the school of Hillel. But one of the greatest rabbis who sat under the feet of Gamaliel in Jerusalem came to that little sleepy town and made all the difference in the world. And Chad, you've been mentored by some remarkable people, the impeccable scholar Ron Heine, from John Golden Gay at Fuller, and your pastor years ago from Falls Creek, and the seed that he planted deep within your heart. Well, Rabbi Paul took that young Talmud, that young student Timothy, and did for him what Timothy's dad never did for him, what only a father could do. You know what Paul did to Timothy as soon as he got him? circumcised him, and Chad, is that something we need to stop and address right now? We're moving on. All right, all right. I want to say something about humor. Because sometimes you will say, I don't know if a pastor should have humor. I've been preaching for 37, 38 years. And I'll tell you that if you don't have humor, you crack. Because the day that you're called to do a funeral, and there are three coffins, and your heart is aching because the one coffin is for an eight-year-old. You don't laugh at that, that's so breaks you. But God will give you humor to bring back some joy after events like that happen within your life. So I want to say, Chad, that uh, when news got back, to Lois and Eunice about what you were doing. They were pretty excited. And they were excited because of the fact that you were not showing up on KPL or KEZI in the latest crime reports, <laughs> but rather they could hear or read what you had done. You see, that young man, Timothy, who was taken by Paul, ended up writing, co-authoring six books of the New Testament. How many books of the New Testament? And two more were written to him, making a total of eight books. Out of how many books in the New Testament? Twenty-seven. Wow. You became quite an author. And when your mom and your grandma, and I think your aunt and others heard, they were going, that's our boy. We're so doggone proud of him. But I also want you to think about a blessing your mom has been. She helped at the church. She worked with kids from grade school all the way to high school, and then your grandma and your aunt. There are some powerful women that have made some remarkable differences in your life. But then I want you to think about the great, greatest ordination service that's ever happened, that it happened at a place called the Nachar Yordan, the Jordan River. And it wasn't just a baptism, it was a Shinka ordination service. And upon baptism, there was a voice that filled the air at Anon by the Jordan, the voice which created the heavens and the earth, and this voice said, this is my son in whom I pickle tink. <laughs> That's the 21st century translation. This is my son. I am so proud of him. And Chad, I believe you have a dad that's very proud of you today. He served as a model deacon. He was your baseball coach. He was the director of your local <coughs> little league. He was the board member of your summer camp. He was your high school Sunday school teacher. And he was the one that took you out to the shed behind the house for some instruction. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> but all those ordination services have this in common. Wow. So proud of you. So I want to give you a brief charge, some things that I want you to work with. Uh, the first charge is from a friend. And this is what your friend said. You are one of the most naturally inviting person, inviting friends. I've never met somebody like you. And I would remind you that ministry is who you are. When you doubt your ability as a preacher, realize it comes to you naturally, Chad. Those were words from Jed. He sees it. I've seen it in the responses of the church here. But uh, Chad, as you get older, I want you to avoid the three great temptations that befall preachers. And they all come back to 1 Samuel chapter 2, where there was a great priest by the name of Eli. And Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And Hophni and Phinehas were the poster children for dysfunctional pastoral leadership. They had three great problems. Sex, money, and power. And God said, those three will pass out and I'll raise up a new Shamael, a new one who will hear the voice of God. And so avoid, run from those things like the plague. Second of all, I know that there will be a, come a time when you will find just the perfect person and get married and your dream to have 15 children. And when you have those 15 children, I would like you to make a business card, and your business card needs to be seen by all the church members here. And this is what your business card will say. The very first thing on it will be husband. The second thing will be dad. The third thing will be pastor. Because a pastor who is preoccupied with problems of the family because they have neglected family to do the work of the church is a pastor who is only half there. But a pastor who has spent time with his family doesn't worry about his family and he can put his whole heart into thinking about the church. The greatest success of a pastor, when that time comes and you have those 15 children, will be to say family comes absolutely first. And then... I also would like to just make a comment for this congregation. I don't know you. After hearing me today, you'll probably never have me come back, I understand. But can I just share a couple of things with you as you have this young gift who comes from God? I want you to protect him from bullies and abusive people. I want you to say this phrase with me, hurt people, hurt people. You gotta say it with me again, hurt people, hurt people. And one of the most important things is that you watch out for him. The church that I replanted over in the mountains, I have a young youth minister, phenomenal guy. Most of the church stellar, but there were a couple of bullies. So Chad, I'll illustrate what I did. Would you stand right here just for a second? So what I did is I called up that young man and I said, this is my son. If you go after him, I will come after you. And the entire church laughed. And I said, I'm not joking. You come after him, you're going to deal with me. And you know what they did? They laid off. They didn't go after him. Go ahead and be seated. But wait, this is my son. If you go after him, I'll go after you. I'm not joking. All right. But you'll say, well, he's not doing the right things. What right things? In the class I teach, I show there's 27 different models of how to do ministry. You know, according to which model? Very quickly, 1 Timothy chapter 4 says, Until I come, I want you to devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture and to the encouragement and, and teaching. But then he says this, Practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. So that all may see your what? Shut it up. So that all may see your what? Progress. That means he's going to grow. He's young. I found out at my age, and, okay, I'm 38, but I found out at my age, I'm still learning making mistakes, and people love me enough to let me make those mistakes. Chad, one of the most important things that I want to say is this book right here has to be your life. You always keep a small copy in your back pocket. If you're pack backpacking, you keep a, a copy in your backpack. You always keep this book. And in this world today, we want to throw it under the bus because we don't understand some passages, because some passages are controversial. But this book is the book that will make all the difference. And if you allow schooling to destroy your faith, you won't be able to preach. But if you allow schooling to make you fall in love with this book even further, you will preach as one of the finest of all preachers. And then I want to say that this job is tough. It is very tough. 
I want you to picture being a college professor. How long does a college professor have their students? Unless you're fortunate and you're in community college. It's only two years, and then they're gone. What I mean by that is if you get somebody difficult, what do you do? They're going to be gone. But sometimes in a church, it's not that way. They will grow old with you, making you grow old. But I'll say there is no job in the face of the earth that has a greater sense of well done, good and faithful servant. But this job is tough. You need to realize that in order to do it, you have to be able to handle the struggles. I've already mentioned one thing. you got to learn to laugh at yourself. You're going to make comments. And Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, when he went home, he would crawl into a fetal position and say, I've embarrassed my God over what I said. But he was one of the greatest preachers. You've got to absolutely learn to laugh at yourself. It was about six weeks ago I was preaching in my church. In the middle of my sermon chat, powerfully preaching, I thought the word of God, a lady comes out from her seat and walks right up to me. And I thought, this is strange. And then she whispered in my ear, loud enough for the lapel mic to pick it up, Pastor, your fly's wide open. <laughs> now I'm thinking, this lady doesn't joke. She must be serious. And I checked, and the barn door, if I had giraffes, was open wide enough that I would have lost all the animals. And I said, let's pray for a moment. Would you bow your heads in prayer? And nobody did because they were laughing so hard. <laughs> The worst part was they videoed that service. <laughs> and my son was in charge of the videos that week and put it on Facebook and said, fast forward to this point so you can see what my dad did. <laughs> but you got to learn to laugh at yourself when those difficult times come. And finally, a preacher's allowed to say finally four times, and this is my fifth. What I want to say is finish the fight well. When you're old, really old, 60, <laughs> 70, 80, 90, whatever it might be. I just want to close so that the words of Paul, not Terry, echo. What Paul says to the young man that he mentored, but you, you keep your head in all situations, you endure hardship, you do the work of an evangelist, you discharge all the duties of your ministry. And then Paul, using the language of the temple and sacrifice, said, for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. And then because he lived in an area with uh, the sports all around him, he said, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all those who belong for his appearing. So, church family, would you say it with me? We, we are, are so, so proud of you. Proud of you. Yeah. God bless. Thank you for letting me share.